This is a special episode of Thomas Kobosinski with the Thomas Kobosinski podcast. We are going to prove Mr. Rich Gillespie wrong about Amelia Earhart's disappearance. First of all, she ran out of gas. I appear on the last recognition from the Atasca. We're running low on gas. 157337. Might have been close to Howland Island. And then you're proposing 200 to 300 miles away? How long did she go to Negro Romo? Come on, man. We spent 30 years of research doing this over optometric things where the deep sea people have found, it appears they found it. She was not a spy from Roosevelt. Even though there's witnesses that claim on Unsolved Mysteries in 1988. It was bad weather that day. Fred Noonan had a hangover with him. Possibly. Don't know for sure. And it could have steered him off the direction because they didn't have the Morse code detector off the plane. If you see on the plane, they lost it. Off of Papa Lee New Guinea flying off. It shows July 1st, 1937, disappeared about 9 a.m. July 2nd, 1937. George Putnam puts out a research and search, including the federal government, one of the biggest ones ever, never ever be found, not a trace. There was radio detections for two weeks. But they could have been false because the Morse code, AM radio, sometimes there's different voices that come from different areas from the world that are not liable for hearsay. It's like hearsay in court. The final proposition is they fell short of the landmark because Howland Island is a very short island. I know they had large, large discussions about this. Mr. Gillespie, you're in a. I once respected your position, but I do no longer. And at this point in time, I think we ran out of money to do this stuff as well, because I haven't seen too many re- too much research on it. And I see that you also are doing expeditions, but those expeditions aren't going to do any good if you're doing it in the wrong location. You said you found Amelia Earhart's being part of the plane. That's not part of the plane. I mean, you're in a dream world that well, you're, million, you're wasting millions and millions of research on what you should be focusing on deep search and diving around how not, basically. Um, you know, no, just quit it, man. Quit it. It does not make no sense. Okay. I've been a millionaire on game since I was eight years old. The first watched Unsaw Mysteries. I'm just going to tell you right now, they did not land on that island. Unless you can show supportive evidence. Let's see. Let's just see something else. I want to show something else. Just look this up. That's it. Yeah. We admire her for going well, around the world plates and stuff like that. Let me show the town. 
Island. Ted Linder takes a closer look. She's America's favorite missing person, right? Decades after she vanished, researchers believe they may have found Amelia Earhart's long lost plane. The team from Ocean Exploration Company Deep Sea Vision releasing this sonar image, showing what they think is the outline of Earhart's Lockheed Electra aircraft. Crews analyzed the groundbreaking female pilot's final flight, including the wind speeds, altitude of her plane, and more to map out a search area that could contain her potential crash site. Most likely, she ran out of gas. So she would have tried to sort of pancake the airplane, pancake land the airplane into the water on the surface. Probably would have kept the airplane structurally intact. Um, and then as it filled with water, it would have slowly uh, sank. Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, took off from the country of Papua New Guinea in July of 1937. Earhart was on her mission to fly around the world and was heading for Howlin Island in the Central Pacific. She made six radio calls on the way there. Um, and each one of those radio calls gives us a really important clue. Using a high-tech submersible, the team searched thousands of miles of seafloor when they found an object more than three miles below the water resembling the infamous plane. You see the twin vertical stabilizers in the back, and you see those very clearly in the image. The size of the aircraft and the dimensions are very close to what we'd expect for her aircraft. Crews say the potential site of the plane is about 100 miles west of Howland Island. They're aiming to quickly return with remote-controlled underwater vehicles to try and get better pictures of the object to confirm its identity. Rich Gillespie, you're done. Stop searching for something that is not there on the island. Amelia Earhart's plane found? We're diving in on this episode of Taking Off. Hello and welcome to Taking Off. I'm Dan Milliken. Our channel is made possible by sponsors like Flying Eyes, the best glasses and sunglasses for under headsets and helmets. Go to flyingeyesoptics.com and use our discount code Taking Off, all caps, one word, for 10% off. We were customers before they even became sponsors. Links are below in the description as well as links to our other sponsors. More about that at the end. All right, let's get to Amelia Earhart and the latest news about possible location of wreckage. But first, we'll dive into go. some history and background. Born in 1897, Amelia was, she got in a plane, a yeah, I know all this. passenger in cargo transport. So where I was manning to navigate and during a flight to navigate parts of the bridge, the plane ground loop consisted of only air with only 7,000 remaining, the Pacific Ocean. They arrived at Lai, New Guinea on June 29, 1937, and on July 2nd at 10 a.m., Earhart and Noonan took off with the Electra heavily loaded for the Pacific portion with 1,100 gallons of gasoline. Their destination that day was Howland Island, a narrow flat island only 6,500 feet long and about 25,000 miles from their departure point. And since they were crossing the international date line, the plane was to fly and land the next morning, but still be July 2nd. During the flight, Earhart reported her altitude as 10,000 feet, but we're going to reduce the altitude because of the clouds. Around 5 p.m., she reported altitude as 7,000 feet and a speed of 150 knots. The last known position report was near That's the accurate. Nukumanu Islands, about 800 miles into the flight. In preparation for the flight, the U.S. Coast Guard had sent a cutter, the Itasca, to the island to help with communication and other issues, including transporting reporters and, very importantly, provide a radio homing signal to make it easier to find Howland Island. Unfortunately, the Itasca never made the navigational radio beacon contact with the Electra. Of interesting note, the Itasca was moored at Lai, and after Earhart arrived, they did conduct some tests of the communication and navigation radio signals, and Earhart had problems with the radio navigation, but believed it was just a blown fuse and it was consequently replaced. Motion picture taken from the press of the takeoff at Lai might have shown the navigation antenna underneath the plane torn off or damaged on the roll, but nothing was ever reported as being found on the runway. During Earhart and Noonan's approach to Howland Island, the Itasca received strong and clear 
voice transmission from Earhart, but she apparently was unable to hear them back. And at 6.14 a.m., the Itasca received a call stating that they were within 200 nautical miles and to turn on the ship's radio directional beacon. Around this time, the Itasca realized that their radio directional finder beacon system could not tune to the aircraft's frequency. The radio man testified later that he was, quote, sweating blood because I couldn't do a darn thing about it. Earhart called again at 6.45 a.m. requesting the beacon as they were now only 100 miles out. Radio logs on the Itasca report Earhart telling the ship at 7.42 a.m. that she must be nearby but gas running low and flying at 1,000 feet. Her last transmission was at 8. 43 a.m. We are on the line 157337. We will repeat this message on 6210 kilocycles weight, and then a moment later on the 3105 kilohertz channel. We are running on line north and south. Itasca oil fired her boilers to generate the black smoke for some time, and that morning there was a scattered cloud layer in the vicinity. Searches begin, as did many controversial stories of hearing radio transmission and other conspiracy-type theories. It was the Japanese or aliens. She became a POW or she was spying for the U.S. But no proven evidence of Earhart or Noonan or their plane was ever seen until possibly now. On Sunday, January 28, 2024, the Marine Robotics Company Deep Sea Vision, run and funded by Tony Romeo, reported what looks to be Earhart's plane at more than 16,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. By comparison, the Titanic rests at like 12,500 feet. Romeo and his brother led the expedition, and both are pilots, and their father was a pilot for Pan American, so this search was near and dear to them. The location of the sonar image is within 100 miles of Howland Island. Now, they dragged the drone for like 90 days and then sifted through the data after, so the image was found after they had completed their runs. They haven't been able to return yet to investigate that spot. And when they do, they'll work hard to identify the tail number, November Romeo 16020, and then we'll know for sure. What helped this expedition was the use of some new underwater sonar technology, specifically the Hugen 6000, which allowed for a much wider scan footprint of the sea floor and at deeper levels. And this initial path was a little higher, so the beam of the sonar is a little more spread out or distorted. When they return, they'll be able to get a much clearer sonar picture and even get a uh, photography or video unmanned submersible down there. At that depth, the plane should actually be preserved a little better than if it was at shallower water. From the sonar images, the shadowy colors do look a lot like the distinctive shape of the Lockheed Electra, especially with the twin rudders. The size also matches as far as length and width. And finally, no other plane like that was ever been reported crashed in that area. And when you look at the image, you might say it has a swept wing look and Earhart's plane didn't have swept wings. Romeo says that's because of the sonar distortion. And he welcomes the discussion on this. He's not saying definitively, I found her plane. But it's looking like it very well could be. Romeo's plan is to go back and confirm if it's indeed the plane. And then if possible, to raise it and restore it complete the trip to the United States that she began almost 90 years ago. And the process to do that could take years, but could also answer one of the greatest mysteries of the 20th century. The exact coordinates have not been released, which is no wonder, as it would lead to a huge rush on the area. Is it Earhart's plane? Well, we don't know yet, but hopefully soon. What do you think? Is it? Let the debate begin in the comments below. Okay, thanks for watching. Don't forget to visit our sponsors. All of them run by pilots like Z-Vision, makers of the brightest landing and taxi lights out there, ClemensInsurance.net. Jerry knows how to save you money because he saved me a lot. Colton Mortgage, ColtonTakingOff.com, MPS Protects, Marshall Protective Services, and 67D.com, 67 Designs, the best camera, cell phone, and tablet mounts that are out there. Remember, superior judgment trumps superior skills. We'll see you next time. Yeah. FBI teenage to, to let them know where she is. Her stood ready to.
There is your point right there. There is your exact point right there. That you can have a theories and go into it. The deep dive is what we need to do. And I cannot wait to see that. Boy, can't we. I've been waiting since I was like five years old to hear this mystery be solved. Rich Gillespie, you're not even close to that getting it resolved. I've argued with you. Okay. So I can just tell you that right now. All right. Anyways. I think this is a good podcast show. We're going to end it there. Uh, I haven't stopped Okay, let's just do this. Mm, not this one.